How long have you been a parent? 16 years, six years, six months, six weeks? Now, whether you are a seasoned parenting veteran finally seeing some light at the end of the tunnel or a newbie who has no idea what you've gotten yourself into, we all have some things in common as parents. Hopes and dreams, fears and insecurities, successes and failures. Those are just a few examples of the common journey we are all on together as parents. Now, I've learned over the years that parenting is tough stuff. And when the hustle and bustle of life creeps in, when we feel overworked, overwhelmed, or just plain over it, it's easy to get off track. It's easy to lose sight of what matters most. These on-track parenting sessions are designed to help you do just that. Stay on track when things begin to get a little bit squirrely, when the wheels get loose. Now, these short video sessions can't answer every parenting question or solve every issue you face, but they can provide two things, a little hope and a little help some thoughts and some tools to increase your confidence as parents. In these videos, we'll take a look at what the Bible has to say about our role as parents. You'll learn from some pastors and ministry leaders who have raised or are in the midst of raising children of their own. And if you're watching this with a spouse or a friend or in your small group, you'll learn from each other. So be sure to participate in the, in the discussion times because you have something of value to share. If you happen to be watching this alone, that's totally okay. I applaud your desire to be a better parent. The discussion questions are designed for personal reflection as well as group interaction. You know, it's never too early or too late to become a parent that's on track. Remember, you are the greatest influence on the life of your child, no matter their age. And it begins when we recognize some of the incredible privileges that we have as parents. Yeah, I said that right. Privileges. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Privileges? Changing diapers is a privilege? Worrying about who my child is hanging out with while I'm at work is a privilege? Handing them the keys to the family car for the first time is a privilege? Saving money for college is a privilege? Well, when you focus on the daily grind of parenting, it's easy to lose sight of the big picture. But when you look at the big picture, it's actually fairly easy to recognize that raising children is, in fact, one of life's great privileges. So let's take a few minutes to look at some of the bigger privileges of raising kids. First, raising children is a privilege because children are a gift from God. Listen to what it says in Psalm 127, verse 3. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. Now, hey, as a parent myself, I'll admit, there are certainly times when kids seem less like a gift or reward and more like some sort of cruel punishment. And, and, and children certainly aren't the only way God blesses us. Not having children doesn't mean somebody is missing out on God's blessing. But having kids is one of the ways God blesses us. He considers our children a gift. And they're no ordinary gift. They are living, breathing, handcrafted by God himself. When God decided to bless you with a child, he gave you a gift that he took great pleasure in creating and a gift that he has incredible plans for. I, I, I've said hundreds of times, that there's really no such thing as an accidental child. Your children may not have shown up when you had planned, but God knew what he was doing. God decided it was the right time to bless you with the gift of a child. What a privilege. What a responsibility. Second, raising children is a privilege because kids hold a special place in Jesus's heart. Now, there aren't a lot of examples in Scripture of Jesus' interactions with children, but the examples that are given make it obvious that Jesus loved kids. He didn't just tolerate them, he cherished them. In fact, he even equated the way a person treats children with the way that they treat him. Look at what Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 5. He says this, and anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf 
is welcoming me. Now, here's, here's two other quick examples of Jesus's heart for children that we see in, in Scripture. At one point in Jesus's ministry, uh, Jesus was teaching and parents began to bring their children to him. And they were asking him to lay hands on them, to bless them, to pray for their kids. Now, it's important to remember that in those days, culture didn't value and esteem women and children the way we do today. There was no social contract of women and children first type of thinking. It was a man's world, period. So naturally, because Jesus was, you know, his time was limited, he was busy, um, there were important tasks at hand. Naturally, his disciples began to discourage the parents from bringing their children to see Jesus. But Jesus was having none of it. He welcomed the children, and he even used them as an example of the type of innocence, the, the, the faith and trust that he was looking for in his adult followers. One of Jesus' most famous miracles was when he fed a hungry crowd of over 5,000 followers. Now, Jesus is teaching, there's a crowd of people, it's kind of going long. Nobody had planned for the fact that he would preach and teach well into the lunch hour. So no plans had been made for food. His disciples found somebody in the crowd who was willing to sacrifice his lunch for the good of everybody. Jesus took a tiny little lunch and multiplied it over and over and over again, ended up feeding the entire crowd of people out of just one little sack lunch. Now, who was this generous person who gave up his lunch? It was a little boy. Jesus could have performed the miracle of feeding thousands of people a thousand different ways. Yet for some reason, he decided that a little, little boy, a child, be the instrument that he used to perform this miracle. In a world that often sees children as a nuisance, as a nuisance, Jesus sees them in an entirely different light. Kids aren't a nuisance in Jesus' world. Kids are a blessing. They're something to be treasured. They're of great value. Now, there are a lot of reasons to view children as a privilege, but I'm gonna end this session with just one more. Raising children is a privilege, and this is a big one. This is where the privilege and the responsibility begin to kind of inter interact. Raising children is a privilege because parents get to help form a future. Now, I know we aren't together in person, but I, I wanna look you in the eyes as I say that one more time. Parents get to help form a future. Wow, think about this for a minute. You are playing a vital role in what the future looks like for another human being, or two, or three, or six, depending on how many children you have. It could be argued that other than the privilege of serving Jesus Christ, there is no greater privilege than the role parents play in the life and future life of their children. I'd like to read an encouraging verse to you. It's a verse that has oftentimes been a source of guilt for parents, but it's actually meant to be an encouraging reminder. It's a proverb. It's a word of wisdom about the influence that you have on your child's future. Proverbs 22, six says this, direct your children onto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. Now, the reason this proverb has given so many parents so much grief over the years is because it's often misunderstood as an if-then promise of God. In other words, if you do this, God says, then I'll do that. And so when parents see their children wander from faith as teenagers or as young adults, they begin to doubt if they did it right. After all, if they were spiritual enough parents, if they prayed with their kids enough times, if they made sure they never skipped church and on and on and on, then, if then, then their child wouldn't wander, right? Well, maybe, may, maybe not. Uh, we all know parents who don't seem to do it very well and their kids turn out great. And we all know parents who um, seem to do it perfect and their kids wander and struggle. You see, this verse isn't as much of a promise as it is a proverb. It's a word of wisdom from the Lord. It's as if God is saying, it's as if the writer of this proverb is saying, Hey, generally speaking, it makes sense that when you direct a child towards the right path, they will stick to it 
or at least they'll return to it when they get older and they wise up. So, so let me take a little pressure off of you. While you do have a great responsibility to raise your child in the ways of Jesus Christ, it doesn't all depend on your ability to get it all right all of the time. God gave all of us the incredible gift of free will. And sometimes children wander. Sometimes they wander for a long time, perhaps even for a lifetime. But generally speaking, raising your children in a household of faith results in their living a life of faith themselves. Numerous theologians and Bible scholars have agreed on an additional understanding of this passage. The original language seems to suggest that this verse is also encouraging parents in a different way, not just to raise them in the way they should go spiritually, but also to understand the unique wiring, interests, skills, and talents of a child and to raise him or her accordingly. When parents raise a child in such a way that celebrates how God has wired and shaped them, they're more likely to stay true to that as adults. Now, this adds a little extra pressure on us because what this means, moms and dads, is that it's wiser for you and I to recognize what God is doing in the life of our children, the interests that he's put in them, the skills that he's wired them with, and to nudge them and raise them that direction, which sometimes means setting aside some of what we think is better for them, how we think they should be wired, what we think they should be interested in. What this, what this scripture is saying is, if we raise our kids how God has naturally bent them, they're more likely to stick to that and be fulfilled in that as adults. God has an incredible future plan for your child. You don't carry 100% of the burden of making sure that that future is realized, but you do get to help. You get to help form their future. Your child isn't perfect. You, you realize that the moment they cried in the hospital for hours on end and nothing you did seemed to help. You realize it when they purposely disobeyed you for the first time, the first time they lied to stay out of trouble. You realize it when they failed their first math test and when they failed their first driver's license test. Now, if we can be honest, you're a little bit okay. You're kind of relieved with that one. Um, there are no perfect kids and there are no perfect parents, but we serve a perfect God who in his perfect wisdom decided your kids were the right kids for you and you were the right parent for them. What an incredible privilege. Mm -hmm.